Good afternoon. This is Gary Adams with the uh, National Cotton Council, and I would like to welcome everyone uh, to the National Cotton Council's conference call and webinar regarding the recently passed seed cotton program. With the new program taking effect for this year's crop, we felt that it was important to disseminate the information as quickly as possible, and conducting a series of calls and webinars is the best way to do that. Uh, I'll just point out the conference lines are in lecture mode until we have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can also download the presentation from our website. I believe the uh, URL where that uh, presentation resides is was pasted into the chat windows of the uh, of Adobe Connect. By way of background, you'll recall that on February 9th, Congress passed a budget agreement that included supplemental disaster provisions for agriculture. In addition, the legislation included the seed cotton program as well as provisions to improve the safety net for dairy. The seed cotton program represents the culmination of more than two years of concerted effort by the U.S. cotton industry to improve the support program by authorizing cotton eligibility for the PLC and ARC programs within the 2014 Farm Bill. I want to recognize the diligent efforts of the staff of the National Cotton Council, as well as the numerous cotton industry associations that worked hard to achieve this outcome. Dedicated industry leadership was also critically important in these efforts, and to those I offer my thanks. Achieving this new policy would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of Congressman Mike Conaway, Chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, Senator Thad Cochran, Chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, the industry is also very grateful for uh, the outstanding work of many members across the Cotton Belt and their support of this new program. Before we review the program, let me address the importance of establishing seed cotton policy in advance of the new Farm Bill and why it was necessary to convert generic base acres beginning in 2018 rather than 2019. Cotton producers needed an improved safety net as soon as possible, and the Supplemental Disaster Bill was the last legislative vehicle to accomplish that outcome. But the Supplemental Disaster Bill provided an opportunity to add new baseline funding through the changes for dairy and cotton, and adding new money would not have been possible in the Farm Bill process, and addressing cotton and dairy now will make the upcoming farm bill development a bit less difficult. Generic base acres are cotton base acres from the previous Farm Bill and were intended as a temporary measure to keep some support on those acres until a new cotton policy was implemented in Title I. The conversion of generic base in 2018, one year ahead of the new Farm Bill, helped ensure the budget resources currently associated with generic acres would remain within the new cotton program and with other crops that establish base acres by converting generic base to crop specific bases. If development of the cotton policy and conversion of generic base occurred in the context of the upcoming Farm Bill debate, there would have been many more interest involved who would want a portion of the generic base acre payments to go to their priorities instead. Strengthening the cotton program and converting generic base acres so that all payment acres are now decoupled from plantings should make it easier to defend and maintain the support levels and payment limit provisions that are critically important to southern agriculture. With the approval of the provisions for cotton and dairy, the agriculture committees are in a much better position to move forward with development of the new Farm Bill. In the upcoming Farm Bill, cotton will be focused on maintaining the seed cotton policy our industry is also seeking some improvements to the operation of the marketing loan program, enhancement of cotton flow, and increasing support for the U.S. textile industry. We anticipate the House Agriculture Committee will try to pass their version of the new Farm Bill out of committee by the end of the first quarter. The Senate Agriculture Committee is likely to follow shortly after. The committee bills must then be approved by their respective bodies and then work out any differences in conference. This needs to occur by September 30th when some provisions of the existing Farm Bill begin to expire. You know, given the numerous, numerous attacks on ag policy by outside interest groups from across the political spectrum, it's critical that all of U.S. agriculture work together to defend the, defend the Farm Bill. 
Let me thank you for your participation in the conference call and webinar. Uh, I also want to thank those that are hosting groups at your office. And if you would do us a favor to give us an idea of the number of people that we're reaching, I would ask those with groups to give us a rough idea of the number at your location by typing in the number of attendees into the webinar's chat window. We will take questions at the end of the presentation with the webinar chat window uh, through the webinar chat window first and then open the conference lines for questions. If you have any follow-up questions or need additional information after the webinar, you are always welcome to contact your NCC member services representative or contact myself or any of uh, the council staff, either in the Memphis office or the Washington office. Uh, I will now introduce Dr. Jody Campici, the council's vice president of economics and policy analysis for today's presentation. So please go ahead. So we'll cover the 2018 seed cotton program information. And just as a reminder, the information presented today is based on our review of the legislative language. Final details are subject to change based on USDA's interpretation of the language and implementation. Seed cotton is designated as a covered commodity eligible for Title I PLC and ARC programs in the 2014 Farm Bill beginning with the 2018 crop. Seed cotton refers to ungenned upland cotton that includes both lint and cotton seed. The reference price is set at 36.7 cents per pound. The price floor is set at 25 cents per pound. The seed cotton marketing your average price is a weighted average of the upland cotton lint price and the cotton seed price. The prices are weighted based on annual shares of production which means that the production, of course, and the marketing your average prices that go into the seed cotton marketing your average price will change each year. To get the seed cotton marketing your average price, we take total U.S. lint production times the U.S. lint marketing your average price plus total U.S. cotton seed production times the cotton seed price, and we divide those by the total of lint and cotton seed pounds. The marketing average prices are published by NAS, the National Ag Statistics Service, and they are not final until the end of the marketing year. The marketing year ends uh, July 31st, but it is later than that whenever NAS publishes the data on their website. Usually it's late September to early October. However, throughout the year, USDA does publish monthly estimates and we will be providing information on our website tracking those monthly estimates and then what the associated seed cotton marketing or average price would be with the monthly cotton seed and lint prices. So as an example, let's assume the U.S. upland cotton lint marketing average price of, is 69 cents. The U.S. cotton seed marketing or average price is $150 a ton. And this example uses the current USDA estimates for the 17-18 uh, crop year. So USDA upland cotton lint production is reported in bales. We, report, uh, we convert it to pounds. U.S. cotton seed production is reported in tons. So we also convert that to pounds and then add the lint and cotton seed production to get total pounds. And just continuing to walk through the example, we just plugged in the numbers here of the example that we just looked at on the previous page. And if you go down to the very bottom, you'll see that we end up with a weighting for lint and for cottonseed. So for lint, it's 0.4233 times 69 cents plus 0.5767 times 0.075 or $150 a ton. And that gets a price of 33.53 cents. Now this slide shows uh, over time the seed cotton price versus the lint and the cotton seed prices. And as you can see, the seed cotton price is in the middle, the blue line. And one thing I want to point out is if you take a look at the 17 values, which would be the over to the far right, you can't see 17 on the graph. 
but you'll see that lint prices actually increased a bit from 16 to 17, but you'll see the larger drop in cottonseed prices from 16 to 17. Therefore, it brought down the seed cotton marketing average price in the 17 crop year. And again, that's just based on the current estimates that we have as of February. Okay, so this next spreadsheet just shows you uh, different seed cotton marketing average prices if we look at alternative lint prices and cotton seed prices. And before I get started here, I'll just mention as well, this is available on our website. So if you want to spend more time kind of looking at it and understanding the calculations, you can get the Excel version of this spreadsheet on our website. So using the same lint price and cotton seed prices that we used in the example, so $0.69 cents and $150 a ton, you can see that the seed cotton marketing or average price would be $0.33. Cents. And again, that's what we just calculated. Uh, just to compare what would happen if the lint marketing average price uh, dropped to $0.61, cents. And let's say that the cotton seed marketing or average price stayed at 150 then we would have a seed cotton marketing or average price of about $0.30. Cents. Okay, to calculate the seed cotton payment yield, we take the lint yield plus the cotton seed yield. This is also equal to 2.4 times the lint yield. And this is because the cotton seed yield is determined as 1.4 times the lint yield. This conversion factor is consistent with the approach used in crop insurance. The upland cotton lint payment yield is going to be equal to the higher of the CCP lint yield or the updated lint yield. There will be a one-time opportunity to update the payment yield for upland cotton based on 90% of the average of 2008 to 2012 actual yield, not counting the years in which cotton was not grown. So as an example, let's assume that the cotton lint yield is 800 pounds per acre. To get the pounds of cotton seed, we take 1.4 times 800 equals 1,120 pounds per acre. To get the seed cotton payment yield, we're going to add those two together. So 800 plus 1,120 equals 1,920 pounds per acre, which is also equal to 2.4 times 800. Okay, the seed cotton payment will be made when the reference price exceeds the higher of the marketing year average price and the price floor. So the payment rate would be equal to the reference price minus the higher of the marketing year average price and the price floor. The payment rate will be zero if the seed cotton marketing year average price is greater than the reference price of 36.7 cents. The seed cotton PLC payment is paid on 85% of the farm's decoupled seed cotton base. So the payment rate is the PLC, the payment would be the PLC payment rate times the payment yield times 85%. This is consistent with other covered commodities in the 14 Farm Bill and how the PLC payments are calculated. As an example, we use the same marketing or average price that we calculated a few slides back, 33.53 cents. The PLC payment rate would be the reference price of 36.7 minus the higher of 33.53 or 25 cents. We get the payment rate. We're going to multiply that by the seed cotton payment yield of 1920 times 85% of base acres and we get a payment rate of $51.73. So we would take the $51.73, multiply that by base acres. The seed cotton base acres are established through the conversion of generic base acres. Generic base acres are not in effect beginning with the 2018 crop. For any farms with generic base and no covered commodities, including seed cotton, planted from 2009 through 2016, those generic base acres will become unassigned crop base and ineligible for PLC and ARC. 
Now, from 2009 to 2016, if you plant one acre of one covered commodity in any single year during that time period, you would still be eligible. And if you didn't, you would only be ineligible for seed cotton on generic base. This does not affect existing base. All existing base of other covered commodities will remain the same. So in the base update option for the 2014 Farm Bill, whatever that base, uh, whatever total base is for that farm for each commodity, that's going to stay, stay the same. This only applies to generic base acres. So for farms, all other farms with generic base that meet the eligibility criteria, producers will have two options to convert generic base to seed cotton and other covered commodity bases. The first option would be that seed cotton base equals the higher of 2009 to 2012 average seed cotton planting or 80% of generic base. This can exceed total generic base. Any unconverted generic base becomes unassigned crop base and ineligible for PLC and ARC. Option two, all generic base would be converted proportionally based on 2009 to 2012 average plantings of seed cotton and other covered commodities. So option two is consistent with the a base update option in the 2014 Farm Bill that occurred uh, whenever it was implemented. This would be the option that a producer would choose if he or she wanted to gain additional base of other commodities other than cotton if these other commodities were planted from 2009 to 2012. Okay, so let's walk through a couple of examples. Let me get the slides to advance. Okay. So on this farm, we have 500 acres of generic base. 2009 to 12 average planted acres are 200 acres of cotton, 300 acres of corn, 300 acres of soybeans. We have total covered commodities of 800 acres. Okay, under option one, seed cotton base would equal the higher of 2009 to 12, average planted cotton acres, and that was 200, we saw that on the previous slide, or 80% times the 500 acres of generic base, which would be 400. Seed cotton base under option one would be 400. Unassigned base would be 100. Option two, allocate 500 acres of generic base to the following crops. So we're going to take the ratio of crops planted from 2009 to 2012, as shown on the previous slide. So for cotton, it was 200 acres times the total 800 acres of covered commodities. We're going to multiply that by the 500 acres of generic base. So we end up with 125 acres of cotton. We do the same for corn and soybean, and we'd end up with 187.5 acres of each of those for a total of 500 acres of generic base. Okay, we'll move on to the next example. Okay, in this example, we have total generic base of 500 acres. We have 2009 to 12 average planted acres including 600 acres of cotton, 200 acres of corn, the total covered commodities of 800 acres. So with option one, the seed cotton base equals the higher of 2009 to 12 average planted cotton acres, which is 600, 80% times the 500 generic base acres is 400, now we have to remember that seed cotton base cannot be greater than generic base. So in this example, in this option, seed cotton base would be 500 because the, that's the maximum amount that you can have if you only have 500 acres of generic base. Unassigned base would be zero. With option two, we would allocate 500 acres of generic base to cotton and corn. And so cotton would be the ratio of 600 divided by 800 
times the 500 acres of generic base. We end up with total allocated base acres of 500. Okay, the next example. Again, we have 500 acres of generic. From 2009 to 12, we had 100 acres of cotton, 100 acres of corn, and 600 acres of alfalfa, which would be a non-covered commodity. So total acres of covered commodity is only 200 acres because we added cotton and corn, 100 each, to get 200. So under option one, 2009 to 12 average planted cotton acres would be 200. 80% times the 500 generic base would be 400. So seed cotton base under option one would be 400. Unassigned base would be 100. Option two, could allocate the 500 acres of generic base to the following crops. So cotton, we would take the 100 acres of cotton divided by the 200 total of covered commodities and multiply that by 500 generic base acres. Do the same for corn. And what I want to point out on this one is even though only 200, covered, 200 acres of covered commodities were planted during that time period, we still allocate the full 500 acres of generic base based on the proportion of each of those crops planted. Okay, now we'll walk through a couple of examples, and we're going to start with, with this one here. And before I get started as well, I want to mention that this is on our website, the spreadsheet. And if you want to look at your own, uh, if you want to put in your own lent payment yield, and that would be that number at the top in red that on this example is 800, you can do that, and the spreadsheet will recalculate everything for you. So in this example, we're going to use a lint payment yield of 800. That 800 is multiplied by 2.4 to get 1,920 pounds. So the example we were looking at earlier. Again, on the spreadsheet that will all calculate for you, all you need to do is put in your lint payment yield. Also on this spreadsheet, we have already multiplied this by the 85%. Now you get the payment on your full yield but it's paid on 85% of base acres. So for our purposes in this example, we went ahead and multiplied it by 85%, and then you would take the payment rate and multiply that by your total seed cotton base acres. Okay, so using the example that we did earlier, we had a lint marketing average price of 69 cents and a cotton seed marketing average price of $150 a ton. So the seed cotton payment PLC payment per base acre would be $52. Now, if the lint marketing average price dropped to, say, $0.61, cents, and the cottonseed marketing average price stayed the same at $150 a ton, you go to the cell where those two meet up, and you would see a payment of $107 per acre. So as you look at this, you can look at different combinations of the lint marketing average price and the cottonseed marketing your average price to see where the payment would uh, increase or decrease to. And the other thing to mention on here is you'll see, if you look down towards the bottom, you'll start to see uh, the zeros. And in those instances, uh, you'll see, you know, let's say the lint marketing average price was 77 cents and the cottonseed price was the same at $150 a ton. This would result in no seed cotton PLC payment. And similar if you went up to, let's say that the lint marketing average price was 71 cents, and we went over to where cotton seed was $230 a ton, at that level, the payment would also be zero. Okay, now let's look at an example with a lint payment yield of 1,000 pounds per acre. And again, we take the 1,000 times 2.4 and you get a seed cotton payment yield of 2,400 pounds. 
In the examples we use, $0.69 cents and $150 a ton, we get a payment of $65 an acre. And same as we did in the previous example, let's say the lint price drops to 61, the cottonseed price is still 150, we get a payment of $134 an acre. Okay, and lastly, the last example we'll go through here, we have a lint payment yield of 1,200. 1,200 times 2.4 is 2,880 pounds. At the lint price of 69 cents and the cottonseed price of 150, we have a payment of $78 per acre. And again, I encourage you to go to the website and download the spreadsheet so that you can put in your own payment yield and get an idea of, of the typical payments under these price uh, assumptions for your farm. Okay, for other details, for the 2018 crops, the Stacks insurance product may be purchased for acres of upland cotton planted on a farm enrolled in the Seed Cotton PLC or ARC program. Stacks must be purchased prior to the sales closing date. And I do want to mention that in later years, so 2000, starting with 2019, this language uh, only makes stacks. So let me say that again. For 2018, that's the only year that you can have PLC and ARC and stacks. For 2019 and later years, if a farm is in PLC and ARC or ARC, they could not also be enrolled in stacks. The non-recourse marketing assistance loan for upland cotton lint remains unchanged in the 2014 Farm Bill with an upland cotton loan rate of 52 cents per pound for the 2018 crop. PLC and ARC payments for seed cotton are subject to the payment limit of 125,000, which applies to covered commodities other than peanuts. Now we've showed examples of PLC. We will provide examples of ART calculations on our website so you can understand how the ART program works as well. Okay, so decisions that will need to be made first from landowners would be to update payment yields if the updated yield is greater than the CCP yield. Also, We'll need to choose between the base update options. And I wanted to specifically point out that this is landowners so that you remember that uh, in the 2014 Farm Bill implementation, all landowners had to sign the documents unless you had power of attorney. So looking ahead, you'll need to verify that if you have a power of attorney, that your current power of attorney is, uh, will work for this or if you need to get a new one. Producers will choose PLC or ARC. Producers will make the PLC ARC election for the 2018 crop year on each farm with seed cotton base. If all producers on a farm fail to make a unanimous election for PLC and ARC, the farm will be assumed to choose PLC for seed cotton. And I just want to reiterate that this uh, legislation, this language, only applies to the 2018 crop year. Okay, so looking ahead for the next steps, uh, you'll need to gather similar information that was used during implementation of the 2014 Farm Bill. You'll need yield records from 2008 to 2012. You'll need planning history from 2009 to 2012. FSA has not announced the sign-up date yet, and they are not currently ready for you to start coming in and making these decisions. But at the appropriate time, you can check with your local FSA office for additional information. We'll also be adding information to our website, and you'll see it uh, in the same link under cotton.org econ and government programs will be providing updates 
We'll be tracking the marketing year average prices throughout the year and publishing those as, as USDA publishes their monthly estimates. Again, we'll have some ARC examples. We will also provide some examples of historical PLC payments and what those would have been in previous crop years. The other thing that we will add is a document that has frequently asked questions and answers. Also, one more thing, we will have a YouTube video walking through this and the audio from this uh, presentation will be available on our uh, National Cotton Council YouTube uh, website. So I want to thank you for participating in the webinar and thank you for your support of the National Cotton Council. Now we'll begin taking questions. Uh, you can type them into the chat box and we'll just uh, get started. Thank you, Jody, and we're going to be reading questions as people are typing now. Uh, and we will leave the conference line in uh, in lecture mode. We've got staff here in our, our conference room uh, to answer those questions, and any that we don't have a definitive answer for, uh, we'll certainly research those and be updating those as part of our uh, part of our frequently asked questions on the website. And we've got Jody one up there on on yours. If you want to do that one. Okay, so the first question, if you have generic base of 60 acres and you planted an average of 60 acres of cotton from 2009 to 2012, is the seed cotton base now 60 acres? And the answer would be yes, the seed cotton base would be 60. Because in option one, you have the the options in option one are basically the 2009 to 12 average plantings or 80% of generic base, whichever is higher. In this case, 60 acres was planted from 2009 to 2012, and that would be the higher amount. We've got another question regarding the, uh, the selections, the whole farm selections for all the crops, and, uh, you know, m might be considered. And that is a good question because uh, as producers look at the decision, I, I think between, if I interpret the question correctly, look at those decisions between uh, whether to choose option one, which would be the cotton, uh, the seed cotton base and then potentially some unassigned or going to other crops. A lot of that is based off of expectations, uh, obviously, uh, for uh, potential payments or support under the various programs. Uh, we have not seen it at this point any tools that are out out there. Uh, we know last time there were some tools that were available producers when they were making that decision under the previous programs. And I think at this point we'll just have to wait and see what type of tools are going to be available. Uh, I know that Texas A&M has, has done one, uh, had done one, did one in the past. Uh, no idea if they plan to do something likewise. And I think also perhaps USDA had some tools as well just to, to help. So. That's something we'll continue to monitor and let you know as uh, as things move forward. Uh, there's a question coming if, uh, regarding the conversion of generic acres into other base acres, particularly let's say you're converting into another covered commodity such as rice and soybeans. I think if those, if you already have some rice and soybean uh, base acres on that farm, then those already have a payment yield associated with it. They would have already gone through the yield update process. So any new acres that are added uh, for, say, rice or soybeans would also have the same payment yield as already associated with those base acres uh, on that farm. Uh, and that was part of, you know, part of the rationale, I guess, for going back to 2008 through 2012 on the yield update uh, was. Uh, uh, was to make it analogous or consistent with other crops. Uh, another question about uh, the, the five-year uh, market year average prices for uh, lint and cotton seed. Uh, we do have on that on that PowerPoint slide there was a uh, um, 
there was a, a, a chart which had historical data in it. It was a little bit hard to see the numbers, but we can get a table posted on our website as well that will give you the actual market year average values uh, for Lent and seed. So we'll, in addition, uh, uh, post that as well. Uh, a question, and we might see if we can back up here, Jody. A question came up with uh, example three, uh, and I know I'm not sure – we had more examples in the PowerPoint than what we uh, were able to, what we covered within this time. Uh, if we can, we will look to back up here to example three, and you certainly are welcome to uh, look at uh, all the examples after the webinar, but we're going to back up and see if we can work through the example three on the base acreage, because I think that's going to be important to understand where your farm potentially falls relative to these uh, these particular crop mixes, uh, especially as it looks at uh, relative to the uh, to the eighty percent. So we'll have a second while we get everything lined up. Uh, then a couple of questions about the ninety day period. Uh, and uh, you know the ninety day period, the legislation does establish that ninety day period. Uh, for uh, for the sign up, we assume the 90 day period. Essentially, at least implementation started uh, on passage of the legislation. Obviously, that time's ticking. That's a fairly aggressive time frame for USDA. Uh, we know they're going to be moving as quickly as possible uh, because that's uh, uh, and in fact, we already know they've been uh, talking to ag committee staff about implementation. Uh, we'll actually be talking to some USDA staff tomorrow afternoon about implementation, so they're moving quickly, but it will take a little bit of time uh, to get things moved through. Uh, I'm going to let Jody talk about example three right now and, and how this one falls out if we've got everybody lined up, and then uh, we're going to, and then we'll come back to some of the questions. Okay, so example three, we had 500 acres of generic base. In 2009, 2012, the average planted acre of cotton was 500 acres, wheat was 200, sorghum was 100. The total covered commodities would be 800. So option one, seed cotton base would equal the higher of 2009 to 12 average planted cotton acres which would be 500, 80% times 500 generic base would be 400, so unassigned base would be zero. Under option two, we would allocate 500 acres of generic base to the following crops. Cotton would be 500 acres of cotton divided by the 800 acres of covered commodities planted during that time times 500 acres of generic base. So we end up with 312 acres of cotton, 125 acres of wheat, and 62 acres of sorghum. So total allocated base acres would be 500. Then there was a, uh, another question came up regarding uh, uh, the prices that are quoted, uh, whether they're Rule 5 base grade uh, with a premium mic in terms of the Lent prices. And good question on, on those prices. Uh, those are, I guess what I would first say is they're not of a specific, they're not of a specific quality when we talk about the Lent or the Upland Cotton market year average price that's reported by NAS. Uh, USDA reaches out uh, uh, to the merchandising firms they, uh, uh, and look at, prices paid to farmers, and it's really trying to get at what is the average price received by farmers for their cot. And so it's going to reflect all qualities produced uh, and, and essentially uh, not be a specific quality, but if you have a year with uh, uh, better than average quality, then the average price received can tend to reflect those premiums, uh, and that will be reflected in that market year average price. Likewise, if you have some years where perhaps quality was not as good and there were some deductions, uh, then it's going to be reflected in that as well. Now, we've looked, we've tracked this data historically about that market, uh, regarding the market price and how it compares to the futures market. 
and obviously that basis moves around or that differential moves around between the two, but uh, we typically use a, a differential of around six to eight cents per pound uh, in terms of the market year average price being about six to eight cents less than where December or New York futures would be trading. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, the USDA currently for the 17 crops says uh, a 69 cent price, and we've seen futures trading in, in the uh, low to mid 70s, so the wedge there is probably about six cents. But that may be a guide, a general rule of thumb that a market year average price uh, will be uh, six to seven cents off of New York futures. Uh, one of the things we will be doing also is uh, tracking those uh, monthly prices and on our website and just continuing to keep up with what's, what prices are being reported for both Lent and seed. A uh, couple, uh, couple of questions here that came up uh, in terms of it. Average planted acres of cotton from 09 to 12 is less than your generic base. Uh, you will lose cotton base acres. Uh, in, in option one, uh, that is correct. If you, uh, uh, those will not all, all generic will not be converted back to uh, seed cotton base. Uh, that was, you know, part of the challenge of trying to work with the monies that were available in crafting a a program and trying to keep it as much as possible directed to those acres that had been in cotton. Uh, Eighty percent serves as the floor. Uh, the legislate so it does create some unassigned base. Now producers can have all of that base converted to some covered commodity base by choosing option two. Uh, the the legislative language also does direct USDA to maintain the records on unassigned base, so that'll be something that we'll see what becomes the fate of unassigned base when we move into the next farm bill. Uh, again, though, we know we're going to be facing budget pressures further going into the next farm bill, uh, but but you're correct. If you underplanted uh, base, then some of those acres on option one will be converted to unassigned base. Uh, the payment limit question has come up. Payment limits do apply to the seed cotton program. It is uh, the same $125,000 limit per person that applies to all other uh, covered commodities except peanut payments, uh, and that payment does apply if somebody does loan deficiency payments or POP payments. Any marketing loan benefits also apply to that limit as well, uh, though if somebody puts their cotton through the marketing loan and it's redeemed with commodity certificates, then those any marketing loan gains uh, realized through certificates do not apply to the $125,000 payment limit, but it is a uh, that same $125,000 payment limit established under the 2014 Farm Bill does apply to these seed cotton payments as well. I know we're still getting some uh, other questions coming in. We certainly appreciate uh, appreciate the questions. And I think there was we may I'm not sure if we got a we caught up with a question about producers that had no history, no cotton history on a uh, that now may be renting a farm. That had no cotton on it since around 1999 or 2000. Well, I think one thing to to make sure is that does that farm uh, does that farm have generic base on it? Because as as we talk about what these provisions apply to, they only apply to farms with generic base on them. If if that farm has generic base on it, even though it may not have had any cotton planted on it since 99 or 2000, there is a a, a payment yield associated with uh, an old CCP payment yield associated with that farm if it had generic base on it. Uh, in terms of the potential to update yields, uh, if it doesn't have any history from 2000 and 2008 to 2012, uh, then probably the update provisions are going to be somewhat limited. I believe there are uh, plugs that can be uh, put in place that would be, I think, 75% of the county average yield as a possible update, but otherwise that farm would likely have to maintain 
or stay with its existing uh, its existing payment yield. Uh, another question that came in about uh, the new farm bill uh, and the potential for possibly allowing a change in the decision between County ARC and PLC. Uh, and that's a good question because the one time the one time decision that was made under uh, at the beginning of the 2014 farm bill applied to the life of this farm bill. Uh, the decision that's being made now on seed cotton, uh, choosing between ARC and PLC is for the 18 crop. Uh, you know, until we see some legislative language developed by the agriculture committees, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, obviously can't say for with any certainty if there will be a choice to, to choose again, but at least the indications that we have heard uh, would suggest that there's, they're, they're looking at that possibility of producers being able to choose, make a new choice once the new set of five years starts. So if I had to I think if, if the budget allows a, a new decision once we start with the 2019 crop, but I guess my own personal opinion is I would expect uh, uh, that to be included in the new farm bill. But again, we'll hopefully know more about that as we get toward the last quarter of this year and see some, uh, uh, see some uh, uh, legislative drafts out of the agriculture committees. Yeah, the question came in about. Uh, let me slide down. Yeah, the questions come in about uh, choosing how to distribute base, and then make the election on PLC ARC at a later date. Uh, I believe if we look at and, and I'll use I guess the decision process in the 2014 Farm Bill as a as a guide for how that occurred. As I recall, in the 2014 Farm Bill, uh, those those two decisions about how to allocate or redistribute the base, and whether or not to update payment yields. Those were two decisions that occurred in advance of making the PLC an ARC decision. And so that would be my assumption right now to see that same timeline. So yes is, would be the answer uh, to that question is base reallocation and uh, PLC or yield updates would be probably the first decisions out of the gate and then look at making that choice between PLC and ARC. I think we've got a new another question or two being typed in. So we appreciate the appreciate the questions. Uh, question came in regarding sequestration because that does uh, impact the payment limits. In fact, the, the payment limit is not really an effective 125,000, uh, as it's pointed out in the question. They're correct. It really is an effective about 116,000 because of the roughly 7% reduction in sequestration. Uh, I think the ability to have that removed in a future farm bill is actually going to be. Uh, I guess I'm not optimistic at this point about sequestration being removed. This is really, and it's probably not something the Farm Bill would try to address. It becomes a much broader issue of a budget agreement that uh, uh, would need to occur. Um, in other words, the most recent budget agreement actually addressed sequestration for defense and discretionary spending. Uh, it left sequestration in place on these mandatory spending such as farm programs. It would take some other type of overarching budget agreement to turn off sequestration. So at this time, we're, we're working under the assumption that sequestration is going to be with us not only now but into the next farm bill. 
Uh, a question came up uh, regarding the uh, crop insurance records for the yield up. Will FSA take crop insurance records for yield updates? And uh, the short answer to that question is yes. Uh, they will take uh, crop insurance records for the yield update. We were We've been looking back at some of the forms that were used in uh, in the 2014 Farm Bill when producers updated uh, yields and they provided those records and RMA data was listed as one of the acceptable options. In fact, I believe there was efforts by FSA and RMA to create a common database so that yield that information was accessible. Uh, there was a question for us to advance to slide 37. I'm gonna we'll we'll do that with the webinar now. And this was the one on producer landowner decisions. So if there's any questions there, uh, and a question about the marketing year, it is uh, regarding uh, uh, Lent and cotton seed. Uh, that is August 1 to July 31 on the uh, on the marketing year. It'll be marketing year average prices. Uh, we will we'll report those monthly data on our website, and you can also find them on. Uh, uh, on the uh, NAS website as well. You know, there's a question about uh, the decisions that are facing farms right now in terms of the choice for 2018 and how does that impact uh, farms down the road. Um, and I guess I would say that as you look at these choices, particularly on the base acreage, uh, once those generic acres are converted either by option one or option two, it would be my assumption that those, as those acres are created, uh, right now for the 2018 crop that uh, that those stay in place under the 2019 Farm Bill. Uh, as we've had discussions with uh, the committee staff and as they've looked at it, I don't think they see uh, any significant readjustment in basis for the new Farm Bill. They feel like that was largely accomplished, accomplished in the 2014 Farm Bill. So whatever uh, uh, whatever gets established here would uh, very likely stay uh, in effect. Now, the records will still be there on the unassigned base, uh, but I would anticipate uh, that the bases that are established under this and then have already been established under the 2014 Farm Bill would likely remain in effect for the 2019 bill. And those will be decoupled payments associated with the, uh, with the base and uh, the base acreage. Uh, there was a, uh, a question here regarding uh, ginning cost share assistance uh, payments and uh, perhaps the, uh, the likelihood that that may happen. Uh, it, and I, I'll just, just as by way of background, this has been an effort by the industry uh, for the last several months, even going back to the summer where we had uh, great participation by, by you and uh, in, in the industry. Uh, with letters to the secretary urging another gen cost share program, and we have been continued to follow up on that. Uh, we know it is under strong consideration by the secretary, um, and and so I, th I think we there's still a, a chance going forward that that can happen. Uh, we're going to continue to stay in close contact with USDA. Uh, we hope uh, something can come out of that, but there are no guarantees at this point, but I, they know that there's an immediate need within the cotton industry to do something. Uh, if it does occur, it would be based off of 2016 planted acreage. Uh, and we think if, the, if anything does occur, it would be only for the 2016 crop. We don't see anything in the mix for 2017. And as our understanding is, if it were to occur, it would probably be about half the level of what it was in the, in the earlier 
uh, half of the amount of money as it was in the previous uh, gen cost share program. So we still feel like there's an opportunity there, but again, uh, no no guarantees at this point, but we're going to continue to convey uh, to the administration the pressure that's out there. We certainly believe this is helpful. It at least uh, provides some certainty for planning, but as you all know, given the timing of payments, uh, any payments associated with a 2018 PLC or ARC program are going to be Pay to the producer in October of 2019. So we're more than a we're a year and a half still away from uh, that payment coming about. So there was a question here about the yield updates and dependent on uh, the 09 to 12 production or current year's APH. It, it, those yield updates are going to go back to the actual production data for 2008 through 2012. Uh, and, and, and actually, so they're going to look at uh, they're going to look at what your actual production records are in those years and take the average across the years in which you planted cotton. Uh, there was a, in in looking at some of the information from FSA, uh, they were clear to say that your APH records or your APH yield is not the one that's used for the yield update because it's a it does reflect an average of your past performance, but it's a different it's an average over a different set of years. Uh, so the, the actual APH uh, that you have would not go into that, but the same yields that determine your APH would go into this average. It would just be a different set of years. This would be a sp specific 08 to 12 year. Uh, question on uh, regarding the market year average price. It is the net price to farmers. Uh, so it is a net price received by farmers that goes into the market year average price. We often use just as a guide as in, in terms of looking to the future and trying to make some estimate about what that market year average price would be, we use the the number two futures contract guide uh, just to kind of work off, well, if the market continues to trade at a certain level, then we back off of, uh, of the wedge or the basis relative to that futures and, and get a, a, a maybe get an estimate of that market year average price for producers. But at the end of the day, the actual data is going to be the one that is the net price back to the grower. Uh, another question came in on the yield update uh, based on data provided by the producer uh, or RMA data. And, and I, I, I think to that question is it was really could, it could have gone either either way. Uh, as we were looking back at some of the uh, forms that were, that were filled out, uh, the actual producer could come in with their production records, and it could be their, uh, their records of, from crop insurance. It could be their records from uh, production reports, depending on the, on the commodity. Uh, well, this wouldn't be the case for uh, cotton, obviously, but producers could use records of on-farm storage, or if it was a grain, they could use uh, feeding records. Uh, so it can be based off of a, the data that a producer brings, and, uh, and obviously they'll need to maintain the records in case FSA goes back and verifies that uh, information. Or I believe that a uh, uh, if, it, if, that, if that data hasn't already been transferred from a, the producer's crop insurance agent to FSA, that it can be conveyed by the crop insurance agent to FSA as well as evidence of what the producer's yields are. So there's a couple of ways probably to get at that information. Producer can do it directly, or it can be uh, it can be conveyed by the crop insurance agent. I would uh, question about the ARC examples. And those are that's a good question. We. Um, I believe we will have some ARC examples up by, uh, say, Wednesday afternoon. We're, we have webinars today and pretty much all day tomorrow, but we've already, uh, in preparation for this, we've done some preliminary ARC examples, and we will, we will get a couple of those examples up uh, by Wednesday afternoon, and we'll continue to supplement that as well as we go forward. Because it is the case that uh, uh, that is going to be an option for producers as well is to look at the county ARC option. And then going back uh, on the uh, producer's responsibility to provide that, again, the producer, uh, uh, yes, he needs to make sure that that data is 
he's providing it or he's on the yield data or arranging with his crop insurance agent to provide it, uh, he needs to make sure that that information is, is on the FSA office uh, at the appropriate time. Well, I, I do anticipate FSA will be quite busy with uh, uh, putting this program in place. But like I said, we know they're already looking at this. They've I think, had some inkling that this was in the works by Congress for some months, so hopefully they're well positioned to move forward. Question came in on the ARC calculations. If the market year average price for a year is less than the reference price, do you substitute the reference price when calculating that uh, five-year Olympic average? Uh, and yes, the, the answer is yes, you do. Uh, so you're right. Uh, if we look back, uh, now we've had some years, I think we think back to that chart that was up earlier, uh, we've had some years where the price was, uh, was above 36.7, but we've also for the last two or three years, maybe you have to go back to 2013 when it was last above 36.7. So if we think about this from 14 forward, as those, as those individual prices come into play, they're essentially substituted for the, uh, uh, for the reference price. So to a large extent, that 36.7 uh, acts as a floor for that benchmark price that goes into, or that five-year Olympic average that goes into the ARC formula. The other one to keep in mind, obviously, though, is that when that benchmark revenue is, is calculated, uh, then it does look at still have that 86% in there of, of uh, the factor that goes into it. Yeah. Now we're... Uh, Slowing down a little bit, we appreciate all these calls. We're going to take the two conference uh, lines out of uh, out of lecture mode and see if there's some uh, see how the noise level is, and then see if there's some questions that need to come by conference line. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. And again. If Questions coming over the conference line, and if you're if you're on a cell phone or uh, not asking a question, if you could mute on your end, that would be uh, that would be great. Okay. A question from uh, Extension about when the when the when the ARC PLC election was made for grains. Uh, Will this replace that, or can we do both? Actually, the grain, the grain, the grain choice, or the soybean choice that was made in uh, in the previous bill, that of ARC or PLC crops is going to stay in place. Uh, this choice will be uh, you. You could have seed cotton for uh, PLC seed cotton or ARC for for seed cotton, and then if. If in the conversion of generic base there are new base acres added uh, to those covered to those existing commodities, we assume that choice is going to remain in place. Again, some of these details, and we'll go back and reiterate the disclaimer we had at the beginning. You know, these details are, are based off of our interpretation of the legislative language as we get further into this with uh, with USDA in terms of actual implementation. Some of these details may change, and we'll update that as necessary. I think the question there's a question here on the ability for a farmer, uh, a farm that has now taken over a new farm since 2012, renting it. Uh, will they be allowed to to use the previous tenant's records uh, if the previous tenant allows? I believe that is 
that's the case, but we'll double check on uh, we'll double check on that if there's previous yeah. records associated with a farm number. Okay. We'll yeah. double check that. Uh, Will there be an irrigated and non-irrigated ART County yields? Hi. That's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, uh, is our understanding. And you know, to the extent possible, those two practices have been separated. Uh, but uh, we'll just have to see how that how that goes forward, and to the extent that information is going to be available. Because uh, we know if we look at uh, the ART, you know, the crop insurance product stack that went in, which is a county level. Uh, revenue insurance product. Uh, in some cases, they were able to do it by practice, but in some counties, there was insufficient data, and so it was not done by practice. Well, I. I uh, Certainly don't want to uh, cut off any of the, any of the Q and A, uh, but I appreciate your time this afternoon. Uh, things that are slowing down on some of the questions. Are there any uh, any final questions? I'll just reiterate: if anything else comes up, uh, you are always welcome to reach out to any of the staff here at the council uh, by call, by email, uh, whatever is most convenient for you. And we will be happy to follow up with any uh, any information that you need. Here. Yes, sir. Here, yes, sir. I can. I'm Phil Warner from Georgia. I missed the session and I, I tuned in here. If you buy that finish, can I ask one question as it relates to the upcoming farm bill? Yes, sir. What is the likelihood of there being a discussion on uh, getting us transferred from having just having a partnership? Uh, consider for payment limit just the partners where we could look at a, a family LLC that's, that's truly family related and fully participate in tax as a partnership. Look at this as a partnership. To eliminate some of this, some of these shenanigans we have to go through and extra tax returns, it just they aren't really necessary for. I just you know I just don't feel a real advantage as far as there's additional payment. It's just not. I don't think the climate of, or the ability to. The conference is in lecture mode. Family member, family family member, I'm not thinking lineal as they are now. I'm thinking to a, a, a degree of blood relation. Uh, it's, it, 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 when I'd like to go to, to you know beyond first cousin. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we are looking at on that uh, that we want to see changed in the new farm bill is that definition of a family member so that it is broader than a lineal definition. And, and tell me your name again, I'm sorry. My name's Teal Warbington from Vinyl, Georgia. Oh, okay, Teal. And then you were looking at a situation, I may, and we're gonna have to follow up probably on your, on your question in more detail, but you're looking at a situation where a family, a true family LLC could be treated the same way as a partnership? Absolutely, when it's taxed as a partnership. Okay. You know, there are other occasions where these are taxed as a C corp or an S corp, but we're taxed as a partnership. And most, most farm family LLCs are taxed as a partnership. They're a partnership exception of public liability protection. And I think that's a sellable goal in the farm bill. But they're not treated as a partnership for purposes of payment limits, just to make sure I'm... Absolutely not. No, okay. and it's just asinine to me why it's not. I just cannot understand it. When we're tying things back to a Social Security number, uh, you know, how can we possibly be playing a game to try to get more payment limits? And that's not my, that's not my intention. Mm -hmm. My intention is to bring some, 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 some common sense back to paperwork. Okay. Uh, to, to, have, to have partnerships that are just organized to protect to protect for public liability. And I think that should be, I don't think anybody would, would could really be opposed to some reasonable public liability protection without jumping through 10 hoops to get to it. Okay. I think it looks to me like a, a, a reasonable sale, and I know that's out the window when we're dealing with, a, with, with new legislation. Well, it, it yeah, you know, what you're suggesting doesn't, uh, doesn't sound unreasonable. Let us I tell you what, Teal. Let us follow up with you as well, and then uh, may pull a little bit more background information. We may put uh, Craig Brown in touch with you, and yeah, uh, and get a little more detail with because 
I, I certainly see the dilemma you're facing. So we'll see if we can get some more information about that. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Conference is in lecture mode. Picking up some. Well, I think we're down on questions. I know we have uh, want to be respectful of your time. We do appreci appreciate uh, you joining uh, the uh, calls. And again, as we get uh, as we get more questions, uh, you know, we will certainly follow up with you on those. And uh, thank you again for uh, joining the webinar and conference call, and thank you for your support of the National Cotton Council.